Well, hello, welcome everybody to Coffee with Coffee. We got another uh, hot topic, I think, on the agenda for today, and John's going to be our uh, our presenter. So we'll go through a couple of housekeeping slides first, and then we'll and we're going to go right into it. No video today, so you'll get a lot of uh, bang for your bucks today. So, yeah, these are just some things. If you have issues with it connecting, or you know, it's not the uh, changing right, or the audio is jumpy, or something, just log out and log back in. At the end, there'll be a um, a questionnaire, and if you fill it out, you will get a um, a certificate showing that you attended today. Maybe you can use that for some of your continued credits or something like that. And then usually within a couple of days, we'll have this up on our YouTube channel, so you can view it again if you want to uh, look at it and uh, share it with somebody else. So watch for that. And yeah, so there's a certificate. It'll have your name on. It'll say that you know the course and the, the time and stuff like that. So uh, maybe that's helpful for you. But um, yeah, hopefully everybody's subscribing to Hydronix. These are available on our website as a both a PDF and also a, a virtual book. So if you're not getting the paper copies or you don't want paper copies, um, just go to our website and you can certainly um, uh, there it is. You can certainly download them and keep them in your stash or uh, you know just page through it as a digital version. Okay. Yeah, and that's what's coming up next. We'll talk a little bit more about balancing. We've got some new balancing products available from Cluffy, so we thought we'd uh, update both our hydronics issue and also uh, do another webinar on that. So keep, an, uh, keep that on your calendar. Okay. Yeah, so I'm delighted. A longtime friend, and I think I'd call him the guru of BTUs, John Sigenthal. I think he's probably knee deep, if not waist deep, in this whole uh, heat pump. Uh, evolution. So I think we've got the right guy in the right place at the right time. So I think you're going to learn a lot today. And thanks, Siggy. And uh, you'll be back. We'll have him throughout the year for some other training. So um, he's always a crowd pleaser. Take it away, Siggy. Hey, thanks a lot, Hot Rod and Max also. Um, glad to be here, folks. I know we've got a very good sized audience. We've been looking over the uh, kind of the demographics, lots of engineers, lots of contractors and wholesalers, reps and a nice mix. Uh, we also have taken a look at the questions that have been pre-submitted, and we're going to try to address some of those at the end. So let's uh, let's go right in what we're going to talk about today. Um, obviously, heat pumps, as a general category, have become uh, very popular, and we're going to narrow that category down a little bit today. We're going to talk about hydronic heat pumps, both air to water and also geothermal water to water heat pumps. And specifically, what type of heat emitters work well with these systems? What, what can you expect from these heat pumps and what they can't do for you? And we'll, we'll take a look at performance estimates um, on how these units work. We're gonna focus primarily on air to water, but I do wanna stress anything we talk about as far as heat emitters and their compatibility with air to water heat pumps, it really applies equally to geothermal water to water heat pumps. Um, seasonal performance simulations. What what can we expect in terms of coefficient of performance and percentage of the space heating load that a heat pump, especially in a cold climate, what can, what can we expect? Um, and that is going to depend not only on the climate in the building, but it's certainly going to depend on the heat emitters that are in that system. And I'm sure many of you know that lower water temperatures improve performance. So Again, we'll get back to that in some of the slides ahead. And then we're gonna start looking at heat emitter options. Now, I, I will say this is not an exhaustive list of every possible heat emitter. Uh, I'm going to focus primarily on radiant panels, uh, radiant floors, as well as radiant wall and ceiling panels, all of which can work well with um, heat pumps. And we're also gonna look at panel radiators. We'll talk a little bit about fan coil units uh, what they can do and, and what some of the limitations are on them as well. And this is a question that comes up a lot, especially with retrofits. Uh, a typical scenario in, up here in the Northeast, uh, there's thousands of houses that have thin tube baseboard and either a gas-fired boiler or an oil-fired boiler. And often those systems were designed around relatively high water temperatures, uh, 170, 180, degrees Fahrenheit at design load conditions. And the question, can I bring a heat pump into that picture? And I'll show you that there are some opportunities to do that. It's not a slam dunk. It's not as simple as 
cutting out the boiler and just dropping a heat pump in. There are constraints, but it is within the realm of what can be done, especially with a, with a retrofit. Uh, we're also gonna talk about options for reducing water temperature in existing systems. Uh, again, we may have a baseboard system or a fan coil system that was designed around high water temperatures, e even up as high as 200 degrees. What can we do to not only the heating system, but perhaps even the building, to bring down that water temperature and in doing so improve the performance of either an air to water heat pump or a geothermal heat pump. So again, I wanna stress, even though I'm gonna talk primarily in the context of air to water heat pumps today, uh, just about all this material applies equally well if you're doing geothermal water to water heat pumps. So, you know, why is there such an interest in heat pumps today? Well, a lot of it comes down to uh, building more renewably sourced electricity capacity, whether it's solar, whether it's wind, or, or even some other options. Uh, there's definitely an increasing percentage of renewably sourced electricity, and that is the underlying motivation for many of the, the federal and the state electrification programs. So heat pumps run on electricity. Now there, there are heat pumps that also run on absorption cycles using fossil fuels, but we're gonna focus on, again, primarily air to water. You see an example of one down here, and then a water to water heat pump. Um, and we're gonna combine these with heat emitters, hydronic heat emitters. So fundamentally, we're trying to marry heat pump technology, especially state-of-the-art heat pump technology with low temperature or, well, I'll just say compatible heat emitters, okay? And one of the things I've learned over the years, we've watched, uh, and, and uh, Bob Rohr and I as well, we've watched different types of renewable heat sources come into the market. Solar thermal is a good example of it. Uh, We've done work with uh, biomass boiler systems and so forth. And oftentimes people get very excited about the new heat source. You know, uh, it produces heat using some form of renewable energy, we get very excited, but they ignore the rest of the system. So here's the analogy, okay? We'll start off with a Ferrari 10 cylinder racing engine. And there's actually one of these sitting in the lobby at Calefi in Italy. Beautiful piece of hardware, very well engineered. So let's say our plan is to take this engine and we're gonna combine it with this, okay? We're gonna pull that little single cylinder colder engine out and drop that Ferrari engine into it. And we're expecting to get this as a result. It's not gonna happen. So again, I use the analogy, we don't drop a Ferrari engine into a Cup Cadet lawn tractor and come up with a Formula One racing vehicle. So we wanna pay attention to what I'll refer to as balance of system. Uh, heat emitters is certainly a big part of that, but piping, pumping, controls, expansion tanks, of all the parts and pieces that go into that system other than just the heat source. Ultimately, we gotta make sure that th those parts and pieces are compatible and even leverage the performance characteristics of that heat source. So let's focus for the time, let's focus on air to water. And I, I put it down as a rapidly growing approach for electrifying hydronic systems, both in retrofit applications as well as new construction applications. So I wanna start off giving you some global statistics and I'm fortunate to go to the HR show each year. And I, I also go by a booth, it's a little small booth at HR by this a Japanese uh, publication called JARN, Japan Air Conditioning, Heating and Refrigeration News. Uh, every year they do a global market study on different topics, one of which is air to water heat pumps. And just to give you a feel for what's happening with air to water globally, um, from 2021 to 2022, uh, a little over a 20% year over year increase, almost 5 million air to water heat pumps globally. So this, this is not a product that is just coming out of a lab. It's, it's a very well deployed product 
especially in the Asian markets and increasingly so in the European markets, both of which are, are strong hydronics markets. So here's a graph that kind of shows what's happened over the last few years. And I'll go right back to the latest data here, the 2022. Um, this red column represents the air to water heat pump market in China alone. And you can see China is almost the same as the rest of the world put together in terms of air to water heat pumps. Many of the, the products that are used globally as, as well as products that are in North America are actually manufactured in China. Um, the European market is this dark blue column. I'll give you some more statistics on that. Uh, this is the Japanese market. Uh, we're down here in this little purple rectangle. So we're, we're just ahead of Australia, but our market is growing and I'm very optimistic this year as well as the next several years, we're going to see a lot more air to water heat pumps deployed in the market. So some specific numbers, China is about 2.3 million air to water heat pumps. That was up about 16%. Uh, Japan, just under half a million. Um, and again, these are estimates from the European market. France, and many of you know, France is heavily invested in nuclear generated electricity. Uh, again, just under half a million units year uh, in 2022, up about 15%. Uh, Germany, uh, really uh, the epicenter of hydronics in Europe, uh, 236,000 air to water heat pumps. And then the UK, many of these uh, countries have incentive programs, electrification or decarbonization programs that are spurring the market for these. So it's a, it's a large market globally. And this year I was, uh, I have to say I was delighted in walking around the HR show back in January, just looking for new entries in the air to water market. And these are just, just the new entries this year that were rolled out at the uh, HR show roughly uh, about two months ago. And I'm sure you'll recognize many of those names there. Those are major uh, companies involved with hydronics, uh, especially boiler technology, Wow McLean, US Boiler, uh, Wiesman, IBC, NTI, uh, Stiebel Eltron has had products in the US market for several years, uh, electric water heaters and, and other types of heat pump water heaters. Um, so again, these are all rollouts just this year. And I put a note down, uh, again, many of you know, refrigerant regulations are changing rapidly. Um, the two years ago when we were talking about air to water heat pumps most of the products available in north america would it would be a 410a refrigerant that's still true for many products today although many of these manufacturers looking at global warming potential of refrigerants and as well as just phase out legal requirements of phase outs are switching to a r32 product or an R454B. These are uh, A2Ls, they're mildly flammable refrigerants, but they are being accepted now uh, in these markets and um, uh, performance characteristics are similar to 410A. Uh, so we're moving towards refrigerants that have lower global warming potential. Uh, I know some of you have asked in, in looking at the pre-submitted questions about propane as a refrigerant, which is R290. Um, well, I'm gonna talk about that a little at the end. Uh, I see that, you know, the summary of it, I see that coming. I don't see it for a couple of years yet in the US market. I think we will eventually get there. The European market is, is already, um, the, many of the European companies are selling monoblock air to water heat pumps that are running on R290. Now, back to the, the technical side of things here. Um, heat pump performance, any heat pump is dependent, its performance is very dependent on two things, the, the source temperature and the load temperature. What are we absorbing low temperature heat from and what are we sending the higher temperature heat to? So we're looking at a graph here. We've got, this is a nominal four ton air to water heat pump. I say nominal because you could see the numbers over here, four tons would be right here at 48,000. And you can see there's definitely regimes of performance well below that as well as above that. So we're plotting outdoor air temperature versus capacity. And we have three curves here. And up here, you'll see they're labeled 
these are representing three different leaving water temperatures. This would be the temperature of the water leaving the heat pump going to whatever the load is. And you see the blue curve is the highest and that corresponds to 95 degree leaving water temperature. There may be some radiant panel systems in buildings that have tight thermal envelopes uh, that could potentially operate even at design load at that temperature. Uh, that's not a wide, you know, it's not a, a high percentage of the current market, but again, as we talk about heat pumps growing in the market, we're also seeing building codes that are continuously tightening the building, lowering the heating requirement. So it is conceivable that some radiant panels operating at those low water temperatures could, could meet even design load in those low load buildings. But as we bring the water temperature up, I'll jump right to the red curve here. You'll, you'll see that there's definitely a drop in heating capacity at any given outdoor temperature. And it's the same story with coefficient of performance. And again, I'm sure many of you know what coefficient of performance is. If you don't, it's basically the ratio of the output heat from the heat pump divided by the energy supplied to operate the heat pump. And we have to have both those expressed in the same units. So high COPs indicate high efficiency. And again, you can see that even though it changed the numbers a little bit here, that the lower the water temperature is for any given outdoor temperature, the higher the COP is. And it is possible under good conditions, if it's 40 degrees outside and we're running relatively low water temperature, you can see we're up around 3.5 COP. So these COPs have, have actually come up quite a bit in the air source heat pump market over the last 10 to 15 years, uh, largely due to changes in the refrigeration system, larger evaporator coils, as well as uh, what's called enhanced vapor injection that basically allows these machines to operate at much lower outdoor temperatures than was possible, let's say, 20 years ago. So I always like to think about heat pump performance in terms of temperature lift from some source material, be it the outside air or water going through a ground loop, up to some what's called a sink material. This, this would be your load. So we, we talk about how much of a temperature lift is necessary. And Basically, the smaller that lift is, the better the heating the higher the heating capacity, as well as the higher the coefficient of performance. So obviously, we can't do a lot to change the source media with, with an air source heat pump. It's it's that air. We might choose to put it on a protected side of the building, maybe in sunlight if possible. That might create a small microclimate effect. It might enhance it a little bit, but in general, we we can't do anything really controls that outside air temperature, but we can control to some degree what that low temperature is. And heat emitter selection is a big part of that. Um, I put this slide in just to show you, you know, what's a water to water geothermal application look like, and as well as what's the performance. So again, instead of outside air temperature, we're looking at the temperature of the source water. Is it coming from an earth loop? Is it coming from a lake? What, whatever that source is. Let's just pick 40 degrees. If we're asking the heat pump to produce 120 degree, this is entering load water temperature, not leaving load water temperature. So that entering load water temperature is probably going to get boosted up 8 to 10 degrees. Uh, we're at just under 3 on a COP. But if we reduce that entering load water temperature down, down to 100, you can see now we're approaching about a COP of 4. And this one's pretty low. It's conceivable, maybe in a domestic water preheating application or something like that, we can actually get up over five on a COP. So again, anything we can do to bring a low water temperature down, that's going to improve performance. Now, there's a lot of variables that we talked about going into the overall performance of an air to water heat pump. So I wanted to show you a simulation for a cold climate. Uh, this is based on some software that I was involved with a project that was done for for the uh, uh, New York State Energy Research and Development Authority, NYSERDA. A couple of years ago, we were asked, can we build a simulation tool that will let us compare air to water heat pump performance to other types of heat pumps? 
So we built that tool and it's a very detailed tool from an engineering standpoint. It really does a detailed analysis of what the building load is. Uh, it uses uh, outdoor reset control to calculate what the supply water temperature is. It accounts for internal load. It even accounts for the wattage of the circulator that's moving fluid through the air the water heat pump. And I'll just run you through a quick case study. We, we're going way up north in New York State, almost, almost to Canada, Plattsburgh, New York. Uh, it's a cold climate. It's 8,000 degree days uh, in an average winter. We're going to install a four ton nominal rated uh, heat pump, air to water, with a, what's called a vapor injected compressor. So this is a low ambient capable air to water heat pump. Uh, the building we're going to put that in is a 36,000 design load building uh, when it's minus nine. This is the outdoor design temperature in Plattsburgh, and we're trying to maintain 70 inside. I'm going to throw a couple kW here, or roughly 6,800 BTUs per hour, as the average internal gain over a, over a period of 24 hours. And this would account for sunlight, people, appliances, lights. Any, any kind of process that generates heat inside the building. And of course that offsets a small portion of that heating load and reduces the, the workload, if you will, on the air to water heat pump. We're also gonna mix in a 60 gallon per day domestic hot water heating requirement where we're taking cold domestic water from 50 up to 120 degrees. And then specifically, we're gonna study the effect of supply water temperature to our heat emitters over a pretty wide range of temperatures here, all the way from 100 all the way up to 180. Again, I wanna stress these are at design load, all right? We're using full outdoor reset of the supply water temperature. This means that as it warms above design load conditions, we can reduce the supply water temperature going to our heat emitters and that is definitely benefiting the performance of the heat pump. Um, now, I'll, I'll run you through this chart. For now, we'll start over here. These are just the temperatures at, that uh, a hypothetical hydronic distribution system requires at design load from 100 all the way up to 180. Running the simulation tool, these are the seasonal average coefficients of performance, assuming that there's no domestic water load. Now, the blue over here, we're going to add the domestic water load in. So for now, we're just looking at space heating energy. And you can see, uh, you can see we're at about 2.81 if we're at a low temperature system. And for this set of assumptions up here, we're actually meeting 100% of our space heating requirement with that heat pump. Um, we're staying at that 100% all the way up to where we need 140 degree water. Uh, our COPs are going down a little bit, but as we get to these higher temperatures, you can see our seasonal COPs are going down even lower. Now, I, I do want to stress, we limit the heat pump to 130 degrees in these simulations. We, any load above 130, uh, we're going to assume some form of auxiliary heat is supplying that. And that's reflected in these COPs. Now, when we include domestic hot water, we actually see a slight improvement in COP. And the reason for that is that domestic water heating is an annual load. We're, it's a 12 month a year load. So an air to water heat pump in the summer is going to have really good performance, especially against uh, water that's between 50 and 120 degrees. So we're actually gonna see our COPs go up a little bit there. Um, our seasonal percent of energy met by the um, heat pump it, it's still relatively high, but you can see it does decrease a little bit as we go to these higher temperatures. So um, these COPs, I, I put down there pretty good in comparison to geothermal. I, I won't say they're equal. They're, they're still likely to be slightly under what a well-designed geothermal system could produce, but they're catching up from where air source technology was 15 to 20 years ago. And just plotting these things out, here's a graph of the annual average COP. This is over the entire heating season. And as we've talked about, you can see the COP numbers do go down in all cases. Actually, we ran three different scenarios here for Albany, uh, Brooklyn in New York City, and also Plattsburgh. And obviously Plattsburgh is quite a bit colder than 
uh, Brooklyn. So you could see higher COPs here, but you can see it dropping off and it really starts to drop off as we get up into these higher temperatures, okay? And this is just percent of the space heating and domestic hot water load that is met by the heat pump. Now, again, I, I wanna caution, this is a snapshot. It's, a, it's an assumed building in an assumed climate with an assumed heat pump and, and so forth. So I don't wanna imply that you're always going to get you know, 94, 95% of your seasonal space heating energy. It, it's all dependent on that mix of building, distribution system, climate, and performance of the heat pump. But still, I, I will say we're getting a pretty high percentage. And uh, again, we can run this tool for other assumptions, but uh, as you're gonna see, even with baseboard, we can get upwards of 80% of the seasonal space heating energy covered by the heat pump. Again, based on outdoor reset control of the distribution water temperature. So we've talked about air to water. We want to run a quick poll here. And again, we're trying to gauge what, what, is the, what are you folks doing uh, as engineers, as installers? And so the, the poll question, how likely are you to either design, specify, or install an air to water heat pump system this year? And I'm going to let Max run that poll. We'll see how the numbers come in on it. So I've got that open now. I'll leave it open for about another 10 seconds here so we can give everybody a chance to vote and I'll read those off for you. Okay. Okay, it looks like we've got about 65. Actually, Max, I can see the polls and it's looking pretty encouraging here. Okay, yeah, I did the presenter view. I never know if you're gonna be able to see those. So, okay, let me close and share that. Okay. So unlikely, 13%, possible if requested, 33%, likely uh, based on my own recommendation, 30, and certain based on client demands, 24%. So yeah, yeah. what do yeah. you think about that, John? Uh, that's very encouraging, very encouraging. Um, and again, this, this year, you know, we've been dealing with air to water heat pumps. We, we've talked about it in hydronics. We've done other coffee with Kalefi sessions. And, you know, it's been a fledgling market. It's been going up slowly, but this year in particular seemed to be a major year. So very encouraging and looking at this between possible and certain, we've got what, 60, 80, uh, almost, well, we've got 87%. Yeah. 87% yeah. uh, between either possible or certain. So very encouraging. If you're working in hydronics, uh, I would encourage you to take a look at this technology if you haven't already. Okay, let's go back. And again, if you're looking for more specific information on air to water systems, uh, hydronics number 27, uh, you can download the PDF on, uh, at the website down at the bottom of the screen here, hydronics.kalefi.com. And also, um, because I mentioned that what we're talking about today with heat emitters applies to geothermal, uh, a few years ago now, we did a uh, geohydronic systems. And again, you'll see more detailed information, more example systems and so forth. Um, again, both of these are free. Just go to the website and download the PDF or take a look at the uh, digital version. Okay. Now let's shift over to low temperature heat emitter options. And this is a, a criteria that I've, I've used for quite a while. And I've, I've suggested this uh, this is not a code, it's not an ASHRAE standard to my knowledge anywhere, but I think it is a good practical number. And I would encourage anybody doing hydronics today, design all your hydronic space heating systems so that at design load conditions, the water supply temperature does not have to be 100, over 120 degrees Fahrenheit, even lower when it's possible. And what this does is it, it helps future-proof your system. Today, legally, many places, you very likely you can design systems around 180, even 200 degree water. Um, but the question is five years from now, 10 years from now, depending on where the market moves, uh, both politically as well as the technology standpoint, are those systems still gonna be viable or are you going back to do major renovations to those systems to make them compatible with what the 
the fuels and the heat sources are at this point. So, uh, you know, one of the strong points of hydronics that I'd like to emphasize, you're building a long-term value proposition. Hydronic systems can last four decades, at least the distribution, the heat emitters and so forth. Uh, very likely you'll be replacing that initial heat source, depending on what it is, but you're building in a high value proposition to the building. So you want to do everything you can to ensure value remains over the life of the building. Okay. And uh, here's a, a graph that I've used uh, just showing typical ranges for different types of heat emitters. And again, these are typical. They're not code requirements. You know, there's not a hard stop and, and start at any given temperature. But where we're focused on today is primarily down here from 120 degrees at design load on down. And you can see there's several options that come into that. Uh, many of the radiant panels and panel radiators can operate at, at those temperatures. And quite honestly, there are some fan coils coming on the market now that can operate probably down to maybe 110 degrees. The, the limiting factor on a fan coil is not really does it stop putting out heat at some temperature? Uh, the limiting factor is making sure that the air that is delivered into the space doesn't cause discomfort from drafts or just the perception that it's cool air coming in. So yes, we can transfer heat and we can we can satisfy a thermostat, but we want to be very careful how we introduce that potentially low temperature air coming from a low temperature fan coil so that we don't create discomfort in the space. Okay. And you know, I extended one bar here a little bit. I'll just show you the product we'll talk about, what are called fan-assisted panel radiators. Uh, there are several companies that have these in the European market. Uh, there, to my knowledge right now, there, there are none of these in the US market. Uh, I apologize if I've missed somebody on that, but I do hold uh, a view that these are likely to come in the near future. Uh, when you talk to people in Europe, you know, how, how come you went this route? And the answer is heat pumps. We want these products to be compatible with heat pumps. And what you're looking at is a, a panel radiator that has a, an array of micro fans. Uh, these are very, very low power, one and a half watts each. They're speed controlled. What they do is they enhance the convective output of that panel radiator at low water temperatures. So again, what we're trying to do is modify a typical panel radiator design so that we can get good performance, good heat output in the temperature regime that also allows the heat pump to operate well. And I put down here, don't feel constrained to select heat emitters based on traditional supply temperatures within reason. You'll find if you pick 100 degrees as your design load temperature and you're gonna size residential fin tube, you simply are not gonna have enough wall space to, to accommodate that. It just in theory, it can be done. In practice, it's it's a non-starter uh, because of the wall space requirement. But that doesn't mean that baseboard stops operating, let's say, below 140 degrees, as I was once told by somebody. John, you know, it just stops below 140. And the answer is no, it, it doesn't. The rating table stops at 140, but there are ways to estimate the performance right down to basically room temperature. And we'll, we'll take a look at that. Now, um, we've talked about this nominal 120 degrees or less. So again, we want to find out what you folks are doing uh, out there. What percent of the systems that you work with, and again, either you design or you install these systems, can operate with supply water temperatures that are equal to or less than 120 degrees Fahrenheit at design load. Again, design load conditions. So Max is running that poll. Keep that going for a little while here. We'll give everybody another 10 seconds here and then I'll close it down. Okay, let me get to the 40 second mark. I'll pass that back over to you, John, and read it. Yeah, yeah. We're, uh, let's see. Uh, from zero to 25% is actually 43% of you are uh, not, well, you, zero to 25% of your systems require more than 120 degree water. Uh, but then as we go up through category B here, 
27% uh, of you have systems that uh, can operate um, at design load at, at or less than 120 degrees. And then next category C is 15%. Uh, and finally, D is also 15%. So again, slightly more than half uh, of you are designing systems uh, that are capable of running at or less than 120. Again, that's encouraging. Again, going forward, irregardless of the heat source, think about that future proofing, have a discussion about that with your clients so they understand, yes, we may be putting more heat emitter in than perhaps a, comp a competing bid might, re you know, might show, but there's a reason we're doing this. We're doing this so you have long-term compatibility with this system. And we've had that discussion with, climate, uh, with clients and, and many of them are very receptive uh, actually, they, they thank you for thinking about not just what's the immediate situation, but what's that situation going to be in 10 or 20 years from now, or even longer. And that's a good point too, John, because even if it were just a modulating condensing boiler today, it's going to condense really well, and the efficiency is going to be really high with those Absolutely. lower temperatures. Absolutely. So again, yes, what we're talking about today in a context of heat pump definitely applies to modulating condensing boiler performance as well. Uh, thermal mass, let me go back here. Now, hydronic heat emitters range widely on thermal mass. So just to show you a kind of a relative comparison, I started with a four inch concrete slab, radiant floor heating, and I took it all the way to one of these fan assisted panel radiators. And I used just an arbitrary criteria. I said, how much heat emitter do we need to provide a thousand BTUs per hour at an average water temperature of 110 degrees Fahrenheit in a room that we want to maintain at 70 degrees Fahrenheit. So we calculated, for example, how many square feet of slab would that be? How many sections of cast iron radiator would it be? And so forth and so on. And then based on what materials are in those heat emitters, we estimated what the thermal mass is. And I'm sure it's not a surprise that the concrete slab is by far the highest thermal mass of any of these that we've looked at. Uh, the cast iron radiator is quite a bit lower, but still it's in second place. And you can see as we go down through here, we get into panel rads and especially the fan assisted panel rads that have very low water content. Uh, the, the thermal mass per unit of heat output of a product like this is literally about 1% of the thermal mass of that slab. Now, why is that important? It's important because as buildings get tighter in terms of conductive loss, lower air leakages, better windows, all that whole building envelope picture gets much better. Uh, internal gains can have more and more of an effect. They can change temperatures rapidly. Solar gain in particular can quickly overheat a space that is very well insulated. So, if we have a slab system in there, and I'll give you a quick scenario, let's say it's below zero overnight, you know, we've got our slab up to, I'll pick a number, maybe it's up to um, 80 degrees Fahrenheit and everything's fine. And then the next day we have a lot of south facing glass, the sun starts coming in, very quickly that space can climb above the thermostat set point. The problem is the mass of that slab hasn't been discharged it. You still have a lot of heat stored and that heat is still, I use the term, it's still percolating from the surface of that slab. So we could easily drive the temperature well up into the upper 70s, end up ventilating the space, wasting energy and so forth. The problem is our slab can't turn off its heat output as quickly as the building needs. So in a low load building, I'm, I'm a strong proponent of using low mass systems and, and there are options there, not just pan radiators, but as we reduce the thermal mass, uh, we increase the response time. And I'll, I'll show you a slide coming up here, how quickly a pan radiator can change from an off condition to an on condition. And then just as importantly, from an on condition to an off condition to prevent that overheating. Okay. Now we'll, we'll start with radiant floors, uh, slab on grade radiant floors. Uh, you know, there's many, many projects out there. I've been watching uh, some of the YouTube Masons lately, watching them uh, 
dumped six inches of concrete on top of tubing that's uh, just stapled down to the floor uh, insulation. Um, I, we have studied over the years the performance of tubing that is buried at the bottom of a slab versus about halfway up through the slab, and there is a performance difference. And this is especially important at low water temperatures. We want to do everything we can to improve the performance of that slab as a heat exchanger. And the deeper that tubing is, the higher the water temperature has to be to drive that heat out. And one number uh, that I remember, if at design load, you're trying to drive 15 BTUs per square foot per hour out of the floor, the tubing at the bottom of the slab versus halfway up requires about seven degree higher water temperature. Now, seven degrees doesn't sound like much, but if you go back to those curves for COP and you build that into a seasonal effect, uh, it definitely is going to lower the coefficient of performance. So the tubing should be approximately halfway up through the slab. Um, our minimum spec has been two inches of extruded polystyrene insulation under the entire slab, only exception being internal bearing points under columns where we need to bring the column load directly down to a footing, and uh, especially important out at the edge of the slab. Some codes are likely requiring even greater amounts of under slab insulation, especially projects uh, built to passive house standards and so forth. But um, one, one of the things I always like to say and kind of kid about with under slab insulation is if you don't do it right, how hard is it to retrofit the proper under slab insulation? And, and of course, it's not an easy task. So do it right. Again, you're doing something that's gonna be there for the life of the building, and it is going to have an effect on the life cycle operating costs of that system. Uh, there is a graph over here you can look at later. It's a, it's a pretty simple graph. Um, you'll see some different lines on here, uh, different color lines. The blue lines represent tubing at six inch tube spacing. The red lines are 12 inch tube spacing, and then the RFF values, that's resistance of the finished floor. Whatever's going on top of that slab, be it a bare slab, uh, it could have tile on it, it could have a thin carpet, so forth. And you can see as the uh, resistance of the finished floor goes up, the, the numbers that it, uh, the heat output per square foot at a given water temperature definitely goes down. So what we're plotting is the difference between the average water temperature in the tubing circuit minus the room temperature. We call that the driving delta T, the temperature difference that is driving the heat from the water in the tubing out through the tube wall, through the concrete, and eventually up into the room uh, versus the BTUs per square foot per hour output from that slab. So it's a quick reference graph. I use it quite often just to get a, a feel for especially the effect of finished floor resistance and so forth. My own suggestion to you, if you're dealing with heat pumps and you're trying to really maximize the performance of those heat pumps as hydronic heat sources, I would try to stay no higher than an R1 finished floor. Anything lower than that is going to benefit you. Higher is possible, you're going to pay the price in terms of higher water temperature and thus lower COPs. Now, here's another approach. We've used this over the years on several projects. This is a concrete thin slab. And in the upper photo here, you can see uh, that's a floor deck. The layout for the tubing has actually been marked right on the, the floor deck. And then the entire deck's been covered with this translucent six mil poly. That poly is there to break the bond between the concrete and the plywood. So as the concrete cures and develops tensile stress, it is less likely to crack when you have a bond breaking layer underneath it. And you can also see that the bottom plate for the walls, the partitions have been laid out. So typically this is gonna be done with a, a double bottom plate where that first bottom plate will be laid out. And that bottom plate is, you can see down here, it's serving as the screed for that thin slab. And typically it's an inch and a half thick using nothing larger than a half inch size PEX tubing. Uh, here's a performance graph for it, again, based on finished floor resistance, and in this case, six inch and nine inch tube spacing. Um, again, I, I don't want to spend too much time on this, but this can work very well. You do want to put some control joints into the concrete. Um, you 
You want to control where the hairline cracks are going to occur. Uh, tile is ideal over this. If you're going to put a ceramic tile down, I'd suggest some kind of a bond breaking layer between the top of the slab and the underside of the tile. And uh, again, this can this is well within the performance envelope of either an air to water or a water to water heat pump. Now, um, one of the, the questions, one of the comments over the years that I've been asked, can I use lightweight concrete for something like this? And lightweight concrete appeals because it's less weight. It's, you know, it obviously doesn't put as much dead load on the structure. It, in some buildings, especially high rise buildings, this can reduce uh, structural steel requirements and so forth. But one of the one of the common ways that lightweight concrete is made is by using lightweight aggregate. And it, it can be uh, vermiculite, which is an expanded shale, has air cells in it, or even polystyrene beads. And so what, what I did is we, again, we did some finite element analysis of slabs and all we changed was the formulation of the concrete, the density and the R value of the concrete. And, and over here, you can see um, typical structural concrete is actually at about 140 pounds per cubic foot. And it could go up a little bit. It depends on the mix design. But uh, as we get into the lightweight products, depending on what the mix design is and what the aggregate is, you can see the R value really starts to take off as we get to these very lightweight materials. And that has a significant effect on heat transfer, lateral heat transfer, especially uh, going sideways away from the tubing. So down here, we're looking at surface temperature profiles. You can see the thin slab here. Here's the tubing. Uh, in this case, the tubing happens to be 12 inches on center. And then these different curves just represent different densities of concrete. So the lightweight concrete definitely has the lower curve here. It's going to have the poorer performance. The takeaway here is if you hear an architect or a uh, building designer of any sort talking about the use of lightweight concrete in conjunction with floor heating, uh, make sure you bring this point up because that is a, uh, it should be a non-starter. It definitely adversely affects the performance of the system especially when we're trying to tie a heat pump into that. Right. Here's another approach to thin slabs. This is a poor gypsum underlayment. Uh, this is similar in some ways to a concrete thin slab in terms of its performance, but it's a different process. Basically, this is a process that mixes gypsum cement along with sand, water, and some admixtures outside the building into a slurry that slurry is pumped in through a hose and you can actually see down here, uh, one of the installers walks around. You can think of this as the consistency of pancake batter. And basically it's a self-leveling underlayment. It wasn't developed just for floor heating. It was developed to level old industrial floors and so forth, but it can work well for floor heating. Um, it is a water resistant, not a waterproof material. I would not use this in an area that is potentially going to get the floor flooded because with enough exposure to water, it will soften up. Um, this is typically put in, you can see here, it's being put in after all the walls are up, the, the insulation is in. Oftentimes it's being done even after the drywall has been installed so that it can actually pour right under the drywall and give you a nice air seal against that exterior wall. Uh, this fellow is spraying down a Actually, it's a bonding agent to help that material bond to the plywood. So there, there are definitely differences between the poor gypsum under, underlayment approach and the concrete approach. This material is slightly lighter. This comes in at about at an inch and a half thick. It's about 14 and a half pounds per square foot of added dead load. Concrete's about 18 pounds per square foot. A takeaway for both of these, these have to be planned in early in the structure. Things like stair riser heights, window rough openings, door rough openings, that is going to be affected by raising that floor an inch and a half, as well as what is the substructure. You, you may have to go from two by 10 floor joists to two by 12 joists or some other modification of structure to support that. So this is not a, a system that lends itself to kind of last minute inclusion in the plan of the building. It is something that if there's potential to do this, 
you want to have early discussions with the building designer to make sure that the weight as well as the added floor thickness can be accommodated. Uh, again, we've done several projects. They they perform very well. Uh, the difference between the concrete and the gypsum in, in, in terms of thermal performance, I, I'm going to use the word negligible. In theory, the concrete would have a slight advantage, but the difference is, is uh, really of no practical concern. Okay, which brings us to what have been called dry systems. I, I refer to them as tube and plate systems. Uh, this is an above floor tube and plate where you can see plywood strips have been put down and it might be oriented strand board as well. You can see the uh, aluminum plates. I've heard these things called all different names, uh, uh, one of which is reflector plates. Uh, these don't reflect, they conduct. The purpose of this plate is to pull heat away from the tube and laterally disperse it across the floor. So you don't just feel a hot spot directly above the floor. And uh, again, this is, this is, I guess I would describe this as a, a labor intensive process if you're doing the whole house this way. It's, um, but it, it does work well, it's relatively light. Uh, it does increase the finished floor height by nominal three quarters of an inch because of the sleepers that are here. Uh, you can see there are different plate. Uh, here's a double tube plate. Here's a single tube plate. Here's a contractor installing nail down hardwood flooring. You see he's, he's driving the nails between the plates. Definitely don't want to drive the nails into the tubes. So if you do cover up right here, this is probably going to get some kind of a carpet or whatever over it. And you can see there's been lines drawn where the tubing is. We make sure that we don't shoot any kind of fasteners into, uh, into the tubing. Uh, very important to have good underside insulation. I, I would suggest absolute minimum of R19 with a heated space underneath. If it's a semi-heated space or an unheated space, minimum R30. And quite honestly, today, most energy codes are gonna require that anyway. Um, here are some performance. Again, we're looking at the difference between the average water temperature and the room temperature versus the upward heat output. This is based on uh, six inch wide plates spaced eight inches apart. That's what we're looking at here. And then you see the different lines here representing different uh, finished floor resistance over the top. Okay. So again, these, this is a compatible system. Just be careful with this in terms of finished floor covering. Uh, you could design this and then somebody could put a, you know, a polyurethane pad and a carpet over it. That is really going to choke the performance of that heat pump. So it, it's very important that you communicate that low water temperatures uh, and the performance of that heat pump is very dependent upon what those finished floor materials are going to be. Make sure that everybody's on the same page with that. Uh, here's taking the plates below the floor. We call it below floor tube and plate. Uh, you're stapling up the tubing. Here we have floor joists that are 16 inches on center. The tubes are eight inches on center with nominal five inch or six inch wide plates. Uh, this one, again, is fairly labor intensive. All the work is done under the floor. You can see how the tubing has been pulled through these holes in the joist and then looped out into each joist cavity. And then you can also see the plates have been tightly fastened against the underside of the uh, subfloor. Uh, there is going to be insulation. It hasn't been installed yet in this photo. Here's a typical tube layout drawing where we try to plan out each circuit. We look at the circuit lengths, uh, make sure we coordinate it with the floor joists. Uh, we don't put tubing under cabinets and so forth. So it, you know, proper planning will, will pay for itself every time in terms of not making mistakes out in the field. Uh, I put down here maximum R value above the subfloor 0.5. The reason for that is we've already got another layer of, of material. In this case, it's three-quarter inch plywood or OSB that we have to drive the heat up through. So we're already imposing some resistance that wasn't present when we had the above floor system. So again, we're trying to keep that heat pump performance up by keeping water temperatures down. And you can use those graphs um, to, you know, again, do the what if. What if I put R2 over a system like this, you can find out that that is not going to perform well. And then one of my favorites, we call this plateless staple up. I say favorites because uh, this is a terrible idea. 
<laughs> especially in the context of heat pumps. Uh, nowheres but North America do you see this, uh, literally. I've, I've looked in Europe and talked about this, and uh, quite honestly, uh, people that are doing things correctly over there wonder why are you doing things like this. Uh, whether the tubing is stapled here in the corner of the joist of the subfloor, here it's stapled to the bottom cord of a floor truss. Uh, here we've got somebody that's trying to make their own plates just with a hammer and a coil of aluminum. Uh, again, here we have it clipped up with some type of uh, uh, talon fastener. Uh, again, think about even if that tubing is touching that floor, when you put water in it and you heat it, what's going to happen? It's going to sag between the supports. So you, you've created a huge bottleneck between the water in the tube and the heat transfer path out to the, ultimately into the room. So I have a term for this, we call this a thermally constipated system. We can put warm water through the tubing, but we can't get that heat to very effectively transfer to the room. And just to show you the difference that plates make here, again, here's a finite element simulation. And the only difference between these two floor structures here is this one has plates, this one doesn't. Other than that, it's the same three quarter inch tile, three quarter inch plywood, and in this case, four inches of underside insulation. Uh, and you can see from the color patterns, especially down here, a constriction of outward heat transfer. Again, we, we call it thermal constipation. And in round numbers, so again, if you look at surface temperature profiles here, in round numbers, a plated system versus an unplated system with the same tube spacing and otherwise the same specs in terms of finished floor and underside insulation, the plates will get you about three times the heat transfer at any given water temperature. So it is critical when you're doing below floor systems like this that you leave the plates or you put the plates in. Yes, it adds cost, but it's the way to do it correctly and, and make it work. Um, I just pity the person that is going to do a plateless staple up system and tie it to any type of a heat pump. It's going to be a, a wake up call and an expensive one. Now, we've talked a lot about floor heating. Is it always the right answer? Okay. And, you know, I put here a few photographs that you'll see in literature from companies that sell tubing. And justifiably so, they're selling what I call the barefoot friendly floor effect. And again, we started doing this uh, 40 plus years ago where buildings literally had about three times the design load that many building codes require today. And back then we would see floor temperatures at design load anywhere from 85 to maybe even the lower 90s. So the floors would feel warm and it was wonderful, very, very comfortable. But what happens when we go to, when we cut the load down to a third of what it was? What happens? Well, every square foot of the floor puts out roughly one third of the heat that it used to put out, you know, uh, 40 years ago. And to do that, it doesn't have to get very warm. So let's take a look at some numbers here. Let's assume we've got a, a 2000 square foot house and it's well insulated. It, its design load is only 18,000 BTUs per hour. And we're gonna assume that 90% of that floor area is covered with tubing, is active radiant panel area. And we're gonna calculate the upward heat flux from the floor under design load conditions, coldest day of the year. Very simple, it's 18,000 BTUs per hour that we have to get. We have 1,800 square feet to do it. And that just works out to a nice even 10 BTUs per hour per square foot. So how warm does the floor have to get to emit? 10 BTUs per hour per square foot. And this is a simple formula. Uh, it's relatively accurate. It accounts for convection and radiation, but basically if we take the heat flux in BTUs per hour per square foot, divide it by two and add the room temperature, we get the average floor temperature. This would be the average between right over the top of the tube and let's say halfway between the tubes. You know, Obviously you saw in those previous graphs that that floor temperature it's not a constant temperature. It varies depending on tube spacing and finished floor resistance and so forth. But the average floor temperature could be calculated with this formula. So if we take 10 and divide it by two, that's five. Let's say the room is 68 degrees. Five plus 68 is 73 degrees. 
under design load, that average floor temperature only has to be 73 degrees. And that is cooler than your foot and it's actually cooler than your hand. So here's an example of a, uh, a bare foot on a slab and you can clearly see from the colors here that that foot is warmer than that floor. Now, I don't wanna imply that the floor is cold or cool, but it's, and it's still gonna be warmer than you would get from any type of a purely convective system or a forced air system. But I also don't want people to oversell floor heating in very low load buildings because the question is not gonna be, can I heat the space? No problem, we can heat the space. The heat pump's gonna be very content at those water temperatures. Is your client gonna be content without the floor being the temperature that they might've felt in an older building that operated at, at a higher water temperature? So I can imagine a, a complaint going something like, I thought I was paying for warm floors. My floors aren't warm, please explain. Uh, here's the explanation. So. I don't want to rule out radiant floor heating. Uh, I do want to stress to you, though, that in a low load building, you again want to have discussion with your clients that the floors aren't necessarily going to be as warm as they might expect. And there are things you can do about that. Uh, you could use a limited area of floor heating, maybe just in kitchen floors where barefoots are, bathrooms, that type of thing. Or you could use some other type of heat emitter, like, like a panel radiator. And so again, I wanted to put that in simply to avoid unfulfilled expectations on the part of clients. Now, radiant ceilings. Here's a construction for a radiant ceiling. You can see it being built here. This is using aluminum plates. In this case, it's using half inch PEX aluminum PEX tubing. Uh, there's a layer of insulation board that's actually, you can see it here. It's a three quarter inch thick um, polyisocyanate with an aluminum skin on it. And Actually, what's above that is 716's orient strand board as a substrate to not only uh, hold the foam insulation in place, but also to serve as a screw base for the drywall. And uh, you can see he's putting the tubing in here. Uh, this tubing is eight inches on center. Uh, aluminum plates, three quarter inch foam. Here's the OSB layer. Uh, you wanna be very generous with your backside insulation. I would suggest if there's heated space above this, minimum R19, six inch fiberglass bat. If it's unheated space, unheated attic, I mean, many energy codes today are at R50, R60. I would even go higher than that if possible because their ceiling is now warmer than the room below. You're going to have a higher upward rate of heat transfer. So if you wanna curtail that, bring it back to where it normally would be without an unheated, without a heated ceiling, uh, you may have to boost the R value a bit. And again, if you're wondering about performance for this particular construction, this formula down here, if we take the average water temperature in a circuit, subtract the room temperature, multiply it by 0.71, that's a pretty good estimate of the heat output from that ceiling, BTUs per square foot per hour. Um, we've used this in projects. I actually have this in some of my own buildings. And I can tell you, it works very well. It's relatively low thermal mass, so it responds quickly. And at some point down the road, radiant ceilings are ideal for radiant cooling. Um, we've been asked about that in residential. Right now, it's possible, but it is very much a fringe uh, technology in terms of availability of product and it has to be done carefully. You have to be very careful about dew point control. Um, not having proper dew point control can lead to condensation on the ceiling and that can be a real expensive callback. So uh, whether or not it becomes a radiant ceiling system in the future with perhaps improved controls, I, I could tell you that the geometry of a radiant ceiling like this is very well suited for that as well as for heating. Remember, radiant heat travels equally well in any direction. It's not about trapping hot air at the ceiling. Radiant heat is driven down into the room. Just some more photos that show the construction. Uh, he's using a wooden float here just so he doesn't pound the tubing in with his fist. So basically somebody's uncoiling it. He's just sliding this along, pushing the tubing up. You can see on return bends, they just hold short of the uh, end of the panel. Uh, in this case, they've put a little two-inch strip in here for drywall, so they have something to screw to. 
Uh, here's a case where several circuits have been collected, run back to an interior partition, and then actually the manifold's down in the basement, which is fine. We can purge the air out of that system. The manifold does not have to be above the tubing circuits to, um, to make a system like this work. And uh, I found that uh, you're gonna want a pair of sunglasses when you're working in a building like this. There's a lot of reflection coming off of that aluminum. Okay, now radiant walls. Exactly same construction, just turn it 90 degrees and fasten it to a wall. Uh, Performance-wise, it's actually a little bit higher output than a radiant ceiling. And the reason for that is better convection, vertical natural convection on that vertical surface. Uh, but again, building radiant walls into knee walls, building them into stairwells, um, even taking this minus the drywall and using it in a walk-in shower. And instead of drywall, using some type of a cement board and a ceramic tile. Um, excellent application for this. So again, I, I stress, uh, don't limit your, your um, bag of tricks, so to speak, to just floor heating. Radiant walls, radiant ceilings can work really well. They can allow you to put radiant panel heating in in situations that really wouldn't work for radiant floors. If somebody wants very thick carpet, uh, they have you know, lots of glass, you just don't have enough surface area, that type of thing. Radiant ceilings, radiant walls oftentimes can, can work. And I also want to stress, the entire building doesn't have to be one type of panel. You might choose radiant floors in some area, radiant walls, radiant ceilings in others. Design them ideally around the same water temperature if possible. That just simplifies your balance of system. You don't need a lot of mixing devices in the system and uh, keep that water temperature as low as possible to improve or maximize the performance of the heat pump. And again, for reference, you can download the PDF of these slides and there's a reference graph there for radiant floor ceilings and walls, what the output is, average water temperature in a room to be maintained at 70 degrees uh, BTUs per hour per square foot. Uh, uh, I know uh, Bob Rohr is on. Bob sent me this photo and I put it in there because one of the things he was doing with testing, you can see here quite a difference in the colors in this area of the floor versus the area in the back. This has plates, this does not have plates. This is thermal constipation, this is doing it right with the plate. So the plates make a big difference in performance. All right, panel racks, uh, available from several different companies now in North America. Uh, they come typically in different thicknesses, usually it's three different options, uh, ranging from a, roughly about two and a half inches out to almost six inches. And you can see if you look at the top view, what's going on here, uh, we call the portion of the panel that has water in it, we call that a water plate. And in a thin panel, you'd have a front plate, a back plate, and then you have behind the front plate, you have these steel fins. And there's a grill at the top and there's air openings at the bottom. So there's convection up through the panel as well as radiant output from the front. These are one of my favorites. Um, they're easier to install. They're less expensive to install than uh, floor heating in many situations. Uh, you'll see a thermostatic radiator valve on this panel right here. Here's a kind of a zoom in on it. This is the room's thermostat. You can use a very small, circulator like this running constantly 24 hours a day during the winter and simply let the thermostatic radiator valves modulate the flow through the panel to control the room temperature and they're they're quite accurate at doing that um, over here is a home run distribution system it's as simple as a manifold with either half inch pex or half inch pex aluminum pex running out to each radiator you do want to pay attention to the flow direction through the radiators typically the hot fluid goes in on the left connection. If you get that backwards, what happens is the flow is going in reverse through the valve at the top of the radiator. And when that valve is almost closed, you can you actually get some thumping sounds. It, the valve becomes a little unstable at that point. So pay attention to that flow direction. And of course, this is just a manifold. This is a collecting manifold that was ordered in what's called an inverted configuration. So the connections, go out the top and the air vents are still pointing upward. Don't, don't take a manifold that wasn't designed for this type of geometry and just flip it upside down with these air vents upside down. The air vents just simply won't work. 
So it's a simple, repeatable, scalable approach, uh, and it can be designed around low water temperatures. Just some more photographs here. Um, we just completed a project a couple of years ago where instead of a what I'll call a typical radiant panel manifold, we used a three-quarter inch copper tubing that runs the length of the main carrying beam in the basement. And we simply tapped into it with T's and then transitioned over to half inch. Uh, in this case, it's PEX aluminum PEX tubing. Uh, here's the tubing just roughed in coming up through the floor. Typically, these holes are two inches on center, probably about a three quarter inch hole. You want a little play there around the tube. And again, here's uh, the finished floor has been put in. Uh, here's a double isolation valve that's there. So if that panel ever has to be removed for any reason, simply take a screwdriver, turn these two ball valves 90 degrees, and you can open these unions up and pull the panel right off. And then finally, uh, a small plastic escutcheon plate gives it a nice clean uh, look when it's done. So again, these are very compatible when they're sized correctly with uh, air to water as well as water to water heat pumps. And I wanna show you just a quick sequence of photos here. These were taken over a period of four minutes and I just opened the valve up and let the hot water flow into the panel. Now this was on a boiler system so the water temperatures were higher but you can see how the flow disperses across the face of the panel over a period of four minutes. And then basically the panel is radiating heat into the space very quickly. So again, a low mass fast response system, definitely faster than a, uh, uh, certainly faster any type of slab floor heating. And quite honestly, it is faster than a radiant ceiling or a radiant floor. Um, you get both convective and radiant heat output. The uh, lower the water temperature, the higher the percentage of radiant output as, as a percent of total heat output. So this is just showing you different geometries of the panels. Uh, from a, Some companies do offer just a water plate without any fins on the back. That'll have the highest radiant output because it, it hasn't been designed to be a, a strong convector. And as you add more water plates and more uh, fins for convection, you'll see that the, the percentage of radiant output actually goes down. The total heat output goes up, but the percent of radiant output will actually drop off. <clears throat> I put this photo in to show you that in front of this panel, you can definitely see that radiant heat is warming that floor area up in front of that panel. So again, very uh, nice, very flexible, uh, easy to install, widely available in the U.S. Uh, I'd encourage you to take a look at these. Here's another quick comparison. Uh, a nominal two foot by four foot panel rad uh, at an average water temperature of 110 degrees is equivalent to about 23 feet of fin tube. So this oftentimes can solve that wall space problem if you're trying to design for low water temperatures, fin tube is, is gonna be a real challenge on that. Uh, we looked at one of these earlier. This is a fan-assisted panel rad. It's a deep convective coil with a, an array of these small fans. Uh, one manufacturer right now is Yaga. They have those. Um, others are likely to come in the near future. So I'm encouraged about these. Uh, I think these will enhance the uh, availability of heat emitters for hydronic heat pump applications. Uh, you can find data on the output of these panels at different water temperatures. Many of the rating tables though are based on a uh, average water temperature of 180 degrees. So obviously we're running those at lower temperatures. Uh, this shows you a couple of graphs. This is a generic correction factor for a lower water temperature. Basically you take the output at 180 degree average water temperature and you either use the graph or use the formula to come up with the correction factor. And I'll, I'll kind of cut to the summary. At 180 degrees, these put out a little more than a quarter of the output that you would get at 180 degrees. So yes, you're going to have to use a larger panel at those lower water temperatures, but those panels are available. And in the long-term life cycle analysis, especially with a heat pump, um, you know, what you're putting into the investment in larger radiators is going to return itself in terms of higher seasonal coefficient of performance on the heat pumps. What about fin 
Yes. Well, there's been two. Obviously, it was designed in an era when water temperature and hydronic systems were hot because efficiency really wasn't a prime driver. Um, at 120 degrees, you get about 30% of output you get from 200 degrees. And here's a graph that, that shows for typical residential fin tube, uh, as you reduce the average water temperature in the fin tube element, what the output is BTUs per foot per hour. Now, I do want to stress, as you bring heat pumps into the picture here, um, outdoor reset is critically important. We might have a system that at design load requires 180 degree water, but under low, I'm sorry, under partial load conditions, warmer outdoor temperatures, we can go much, much lower. The other thing that plays into this is internal heat gain. Uh, I took an example here, especially today with modern construction, there are many hot that really don't need any heat input down to outdoor temperatures of 55, maybe even 50 degrees. In extreme cases with extremely well insulated envelopes, it could be even lower than that. So I took a case of a house that really, through its internal gains, can maintain 70 degrees when it's 55 degrees outside or, or slightly warmer. And what that does mathematically is it offsets the reset line. We call this a parallel offset. And there are formulas to calculate this, but it's, it benefits you. Now, to show you the benefit, here's bin temperature data for Syracuse, New York, a relatively cold climate. It's around 6,700 degree days on average winter. And you'll say there's a lot of the winter, a lot of the years, uh, I'm sorry, the hours in a year are spent at these conditions that are well above the design load conditions, okay? If we put all this information together, here's a graph. And what this shows, the, the bars here represent those numbers, all right? The yellow bars are basically at or above 55 degrees outside where you really don't need any heat. So in effect, you could just kind of cross those out. The green bars show you where the hours in a year where the temperature can be at or below 120 degrees. This is just the offset reset line identified 120 degrees. So basically these green bars are all hours in the year where a supply water temperature of 120 or less will work. And then the blue bars were, would be where that base board has to have higher temperatures. And just as a percentage, if we total the green bars and the blue bars and look at what percentage of that total are is represented by the green bars, it's about 82%. So again, we're I, I, I would encourage you not to completely rule out a baseboard system. You are going to need supplemental heat for those cold days, and you are definitely going to want to use outdoor reset control. Um, again, we can evaluate what that performance is going to be using software, but my experience to date has been anywhere is in a range of 80, 85% of your load, even in a relatively cold climate, can come from the heat pump. Uh, based on outdoor reset control, and the balance of it has to come from something else. And typically, if it's a retrofit, leave the boiler in the system and um, use that boiler as both supplemental output on those cold days, as well as backup. So again, we ran a simulation here, and I know we're, we're getting kind of short on time here, so I'm going to just kind of jump through a lot of this. This was a, a 50,000 BTU per hour design load in a 2,500 square foot building. Uh, the location was Syracuse. It's a four ton air to water heat pump. It's got a baseboard system that needs 170 degree water at design load. Now we're not modifying that baseboard system. And we're also gonna throw in that domestic water load as well. So what does the simulation tell us? Oh, by the way, we limited the heat pump to 130 degrees. Any, any heating requirement above 130 had to come from something else, the boiler typically. And we do account for defrost on the air to water heat pump, which does reduce the performance. So again, I'm gonna jump right through these numbers quickly, just to show you, this is the input screen on the simulation software. We're needing 170 at design load. Um, the blue screen down here is the output. So what's the bottom line? Well. The total heating energy was about 110 million BTUs for space heating and roughly I'll round up to 13 
million BTUs for domestic water. So we're at about 123 million for the, the winter season. And out of that, the auxiliary heat was only 9.3 million BTUs. So the auxiliary heat supplied by the boiler was about seven and a half percent of the total space heating energy. The heat pump delivered about 92.5% of that space heating and domestic hot water energy. So again, that's encouraging, but as you go into a project with baseboard, uh, I would still encourage you to take an inventory of the baseboard and do a, a quick calculation based on uh, that graph that I showed you earlier. What At 120 degrees and the existing amount of baseboard, how much output do I have? And then, um, you know, from there, honestly, a, a simulation of some sort is necessary to get, get the exact numbers, but employ outdoor reset control and you're, you, know, you have a salvageable system. Now, I've got a few minutes left. Let's quickly go through these slides. And, and by the way, uh, there is an hydronics uh, on this number 25 is all devoted to lowering the water temperature in existing systems. Two ways to do it. You improve the building envelope, reduce air leakage, add insulation, change the windows, whatever, you're reducing that load, or you can add heat emitters, or you can do some combination of this, okay? So real quick, uh, and again, in the interest of time, I don't wanna read all this to you. Real quickly, we took a building at 100,000 BTUs per hour, and we reduced the load by 30%. So we brought it down to 70,000 BTUs per hour, design load, and what this formula has told us is that we've gone from 180 degree water temperature at design load down to 147 degrees at design load. So in terms of an outdoor reset line, this is the difference. So just a 30% reduction in building load implies quite a change in, uh, in the design temperature as well as what the outdoor reset would be. So what does it mean in terms of seasonal performance? Well, again, there are different ways to analyze this uh, based on bin temperature data and simulations. I, I, again, I will give you the summary. By reducing that water temperature from 180 to 147, we are meeting roughly 93% of the seasonal space heating load at or below 120 degree water temperature with that system. And the, the blue area here is the area where we have to be above 120 degrees. So again, this would be where the boiler would take over. Um, oh, well, I say that I'm assuming that the boiler would take over above 120 degrees. So again, the, the net result is a 30% reduction in your design load has a pretty profound effect on what the performance of that heat pump will be. So if there are ways to incorporate uh, building weatherization as part of uh, sales proposals. I know there are a number of companies today that are doing both HVAC systems as well as building weatherization. Uh, typically, the building weatherization oftentimes is the low-hanging fruit. It's the highest return on investment, and it's certainly going to pay for itself uh, return on investment-wise uh, when you're using a heat pump. Anything you can do to bring that water temperature down is going to have a um, return for you. Uh, real quick, and these are, again, these are in Hydronics 25, if you want to look at them, ways to convert a, let's say, a series baseboard loop over to a uh, kind of a hybrid system here where we've added some heat emitters, and we've also made some strategic cuts in the circuit, and we've reconnected some of those segments using half-inch packs back to a manifold. So we've got, uh, if you will, a combination of some series connected emitters, but we also have broken them up in this case into four parallel circuits. That will bring water temperature down, okay? Because the uh, average water temperature in the system actually will be higher because we don't have the series temperature drop, okay? And there are fittings like this uh, that allow you to transition between three quarter inch copper and PEX or PEX aluminum PEX. There's a lot of those fittings on the market now. So the hardware is not unattainable. It's, it's readily available to do this. And you also see, I, I've mixed in some high output baseboard with the bigger fins. Here's some panel rads that have been mixed into it. Um, you can convert it into a zone system using thermostatic valves. 
Uh, now you've got four separate zones in the system, and you can see the geometries on these valves, whether they're a capillary tube type valve or a radiator that has an integral valve or using a uh, dedicated valve, perhaps at the end of the fin tube with a, with a uh, thermostatic operator. And we're, if we do that, you can bring in one of the new variable speed pressure regulated circulators, tie in a hydraulic separator. So you're getting air, dirt, magnetic particle separation. Uh, so really, that's a, a major improvement, not only in the thermal aspects of the system, but also in the hydraulic aspects of these circulators will reduce their speed automatically as these thermostatic radiator valves open and close. If you want to use electric thermostats, you can do that. Just use a manifold, add some valve actuators to the manifold, tie them into a zone control panel and some thermostats. So uh, this is possible as well as the uh, TRD approach. So last poll question. Again, we want to see what, what your experience out in the field is. How have you dealt with the need to lower water temperature in existing systems? And you can see the choices there. So, Max, I'm going to let you run that. Sure. While those are rolling, I wanted to mention one of the easy things to miss if in a retrofit, if you're looking to measure the amount of fin tube that's in a building. Mm -hmm. Don't measure just the sheet metal. <laughs> Sometimes there could be right. 10 feet of sheet metal and only you know four feet of fin under there. So that's the that's the number that you want to get. So you might have to pull the front off or take a look. You can, yeah, take um, a look. Yeah, like some, yeah. some contractors will just run the enclosure wall to wall just to keep the aesthetics the same and and just you know smaller fin tube. And you know, fin tubing. Don't don't count the piping that doesn't have the fins yeah. on it. Yeah. Yeah, um, and then there was another mention of um, TABS. I forget what the acronym was, thermally activated building structure or system like that. That would be uninsulated concrete in a multi-story building for both mm -hmm. up and down radiation, basically. that That's a good yeah. fit for commercial. Yeah, yeah, that's being used. Uh, I know uh, National Renewable Energy Labs uh, uses that system out there. Um, the, the challenge with that, just to you know, make sure that people understand, the challenge with that, you, you want to make sure that the upward versus downward heat fluxes are compatible with the spaces. Um, you know, let's just say hypothetically you have, you know, you have the same upward output per square foot and, and lower output per square foot. What happens if the space below is half the design load of the space above? So you, you don't have the ability typically to proportion out how much of that heat or cooling effect for that matter goes up versus down. If you're doing a very base load scenario and you're supplementing it with something else and you're running those panels at relatively low temperatures in heating and, and relatively high temperatures well above dew point in cooling, this is not as much of a factor, but just be careful of that. Make sure that if you're doing a, a, a bi-directional radiant panel that uh, the fluxes that are going in each direction are appropriate for what the loads are. That's a good point. And for, yeah, it's almost like the thermostat needs to change for that zone valve, depending on heating or cooling <laughs> in some cases yeah. too. Because you can turn it off for the neighbor upstairs who might be too hot or cold. Um, depending on who makes that temperature decision, if it's not a more complicated thing than a thermostat. Yeah. Um, okay, I'm so, gonna close this poll here. Yeah, so um, again, I can see the results, Max. It looks 34% say they've never had to do it. 9% say they'd recommend reducing the building's heating load. 9% also said recommended adding more heat emitters. And then the, the winner, 49%, I recommend both A and I'm sorry, both B and C. And that, that's fine. Uh, it's going to be a case by case scenario where you, you come into a building and obviously if you see um, extremely strong air leakage, you know, you, you should approach that before you try to overpower it with any type of heat emitter or heat pump combination. Um, and this is that's going to be, a, yeah. again, this is going to be an active question as we go forward in, into heat pumps and we're going to run into scenarios with high temperature emitters. Um, you know, as we talked about, it is possible to bring that water temperature down. Uh, again, I'll stress um, Hydronics 25, and I think that is actually, yeah, there's the next slide. So again, you can go to the website, download Hydronics 25, 
everything we've talked about and more on reducing water temperature is actually in there. And I know one of the questions that came in, uh, Max, was about standing cast iron radiators. There are tables in Hydronics 25 that allow you to assess based on the, the geometry of the radiator, what the heat output is going to be. So uh, absolutely they are within the realm of possibility to tie to a heat pump, uh, look at the water temperature output uh, relationship, and I, I, I can't overstress this, make sure you put a magnetic dirt separator of some sort in that system. If it's an old system, especially if it ever operated with steam, you're going to have magnetite in the system and you don't want that inside the heat pump following up the uh, heat exchanger. So make sure you, you uh, flush the system, but also catch the residual uh, magnetite using some type of magnetic dirt separating device. And I think we're almost, yeah, we're almost there. We, uh, so in summary, uh, what I call winning formula, obviously, we want to see low loss building envelopes. Why, why put in, you know, an eight ton heat pump when a three ton heat pump would work, so to speak, building load reduction. We're going to combine that with modern hydronics technology. Uh, again, we've talked about the, the panel rads that are available today, uh, the very low power circulators that are available today. Just as a, an example, we've got a building that has a 36,000 BTU per hour design load. And one of those circulators operating at full speed is 44 watts. It, it handles the entire distribution system in that house. So 36,000 BTUs per hour being delivered on 44 watts at design load. And on part load, it's, it's often in between 20 and 30 watts. So it's, it's an incredible advantage of using water, especially with these new circulators, uh, the ability to move heat at very, very low parasitic power. Uh, we're going to combine it with both air to water as well as geothermal water to water heat pumps. And we're going to get energy savings. We're going to retain that superior comfort that hydronics has been known for. And we're doing our part with carbon reduction and, and participation with where the energy markets are, are going to take us. So hopefully you see there's, a, there's definitely a tie in between heat pumps, modern hydronics technology going forward. So, uh, Max, I'm going to let you run through these quick, and then I'll hang on if anybody has a, a few questions. Sure. So we're happy to help with whatever you run into this group of, uh, and we have two more uh, members of the team here that we've hired. We'll answer a phone call. So this goes right to this phone number on the screen here, goes right to a human being. So that's helpful. They'll also cover these topics from the tech support lines in this podcast. So that's a good way to see what's going on out in the field. And we always love to see your projects on social media, and we'll like and share those and uh, and uh, show everybody what a great job you're doing. <laughs> and that's kind of one of the fun things about the visibility we get into the market without uh, without traveling to all corners of the U.S. You can see that every day. So um, I think that that takes us to the end. So I had a couple other questions. One thing that I wanted to mention to we had some questions about kind of running the numbers for some of those different heat emitters. So mm -hmm. the PEX manufacturers can run a loop CAD calculation and say, okay, if you're going to do a dry panel, here is what you're going to need temperature wise, or, you know, here are three different heat emitters that you could use to cover that without having to take a guess at it. They can, you know, if you've got the, the building set of plans and, you know, the R values of everything, that you're working with, you can model that a few different ways to see if like, okay, dry panels seem like they make a lot of sense because we want to have to reinforce the structure, but we're going to need a you know, warmer temperature or whatever the, the case may be. So that's a good way to narrow down that math. Um, yeah, we had a yeah. question. The design oh, software from several companies. I mean, we're back to, you know, radiant panel design. Uh, I've given you a few graphs that will get you certainly in the ballpark. And then tools like what Max has mentioned, LoopCAD, and, and some of the other uh, tubing manufacturers have software that can do that for you. So uh, aim at or below that 120 degree number, and you'll, your heat pump will thank you. One of the other questions kind of goes to what we were talking about before we launched the webinar. In your uh, Siegenthaler March Madness bracket for refrigerations. Which uh, which refrigeration is going to be the uh, the final 
winner in the next five years if you had to put all of the available refrigerants on the market uh, in the bracket today? Who do you who are you picking? Okay, well, I've been throwing globally or within North America. <laughs> uh, we'll say North America. Yeah, I, I think what what is likely to happen, and just based on what has happened over the you know the last many years, uh, we all already are seeing R32 and 454B coming out in in products. You're going to see that this year, R32. R410A is, I believe, no longer can the manufacturers put that in starting, I believe it's January 1st, 2026, if I remember right. So 410A is on its way out. Uh, and, and it'll go out like R22 went out. It'll go out over a period of years. So there'll be a phase out. It'll get more and more expensive. Uh, in the near term, R32 and 454B seem to be the two in the near term. I think the long-term solution is probably R290, which is which is propane. Uh, CO2, there are people building air to water heat pumps on CO2. Uh, it's especially prevalent in air to water heat pumps that are designed for domestic water heating. Uh, there's one residential system out there, uh, but several of the companies well known for commercial water heaters uh, have CO2 based air to water heat pumps, and, and they're producing water temperatures 175, even 180 with, with that. Uh, if I had a bet in five years with rational, <laughs> rational thinking dominating politics, maybe that's a polite way to say it, uh, I, think, I think R290 will probably be accepted uh, within UL, within um, um, AHRI. I, I think you're going to see uh, listings and safety standards and manufacturers uh, going to it. So in the near term, R32, R454B, uh, five years plus probably R290. And um, that's that's just speculation based on what I, I'm seeing up to this point in time. Obviously, um, regulations could change that. But as I say, there are many, many air to water heat pumps operating on R290 in the European market right now. And uh, it's likely as has often been the case with hydronics, that technology we see in Europe will eventually migrate to North America. Um, and then the, there's one other one that um, I wanted to comment on so the warm floor thing that you mentioned that the we used to have those nice toasty floors and now we just don't need to and more you know and, and just building code compliant buildings. There were some systems that at my last job when I worked at Rayhow that people were asking about doing warm floors in like Southern California, and then mm -hmm. they would have to air condition that load back out. So they wanted both at the same time. And if anybody is on the call and they've had that request, just, just say no to that. We're, uh, we're beyond that. <laughs> and yeah, that society, yeah. we can't be heating and cooling the, the same space at the same time. Yeah, so once we're trying to get rid of loads from a server or you know, something like that. But yeah, what I, what I would suggest would be instead of doing, you know, the majority of the floor area, just focus on areas where people are likely to have, you know, bare feet or socks. Like, uh, for example, a kitchen where there's tile, where people would stand, you know, by an island or by a countertop, a bathroom, uh, maybe under a dining room table, something like that. You can do what I'll call strategic areas of floor heating. And if you reduce the area, which you would by just putting it in certain portions of the floor, your water temperature requirement does go up for a given amount of heat output. And again, what you're trading off, you're, you're bringing back the, the warm floor where it's most sought after, but you're doing it at the expense of lower COP on the heat pump. And, you know, I'm not going to argue one versus the other because, you know, if we've had clients, and I'm sure many of you have, that are ultra tuned into every last BTU. They want to chop everything they can, and they're willing to make whatever comfort sacrifices uh, go along with that. The other side of the spectrum is a client that that wants a warm floor, and that's you know that is not something they're willing to give up. So there are strategies, and again, I'll point to 
panel rats. A panel radiator can, because it's a much smaller area, the surface of that panel is going to be warmer than it would with a much broader floor area for the same heat output. Uh, and I've got a nice photo of my grandson who comes in for playing in the snow. He lays on the floor and puts his bare feet against a panel radiator. So uh, panel rads can do that for you. Uh, so there are options to just giving up on floor heating in those low load buildings. But the, the main reason I wanted to put that slide in here is make sure the clients understand the implications of using broad area floor heating in a uh, very low energy use building. Uh, Great. Yeah. Well, I think that we have a handful of other ones that are more specific that we'll follow up with by email after the webinar. Uh, but I think that that is enough to, to close it out today. Thank you again, John. And uh, we appreciate your expertise here. Uh, the presentation will be available, a PDF of it, uh, in the post-webinar survey. We had some questions about that, and we'll also have it up on, on YouTube over the, the weekend, probably. So thank you again, everybody, and we'll see you soon. Thank you.